Assalamu alaikum all and welcome to another episode of the Optimized Muslim podcast interview series. Alhamdulillah, today uh, another guest, another guest that I think aligns well with this project and we'll all benefit from inshallah. I've got a brother Jan who goes by the name the Slovak Muslim um, on YouTube and other socials. We'll link all that in the description. Um, first of all, I know we've said it before, but Assalamu alaikum Jan, introduce um, Jazakallah for joining. And um, yeah, Jazakallah for taking your time. Walaikum salam. Yeah, I'm happy to be here and uh, hopefully we'll have something uh, beneficial for the listeners. Yes, definitely, inshallah. So I wanted to have a, um, I kind of use this podcast a bit selfishly in that <clears throat> whatever I'm interested in, if I see someone that I want to kind of speak to, it gives me a good excuse to have like a one-on-one -on -one chat with them but also have in mind that I'm looking to extract stuff that can benefit the audience and the people watching as well um, so that's how I go about this I wanted to talk to you about your journey to Islam but not too much on that because I know you're probably quite bored of speaking about that perhaps yeah. so that's just going to be like a brief synopsis introduction just to kind of introduce yourself to the audience and then after that I'm going to talk about <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, da'wah, like the state of da'wah currently, um, what you think are the best methods for, because you're in a much better place. Normally, I'm just theorizing this kind of stuff. But having gone through that journey, we can definitely learn from you in terms of what you perceive to be better methods of da'wah, um, bringing people to Islam and stuff. And your assessment of like the current kind of situation with how online da'wah is and stuff. After that, then just probably um more general questions i've been watching i like to binge watch the content of the guests before i have them on so i was watching some of your vid videos and um i was quite interested in some of the stuff that you talk about uh, business as well um and just daily routine and stuff like that as well like self-development related questions so that was just to give you kind of uh, and the audience uh, a view of like how the interview i'm planning for it to go inshallah um so going into the first question if you can just like give a brief kind of biography of yourself um, up until now and also weave into that your story of how you found Islam <laughs> and then I'll branch off from that inshallah Jazakallah khairan Yeah, thank you so much uh, Actually, m maybe a side note I also use podcasts uh, I have six of them uh, for different types of people uh, not just Islamic ones so I use it for business I actually have a podcast production company so it's a very good way to build relationships I agree with that uh, but uh, regarding myself so <clears throat> I'm 30 years old I live in Slovakia I've just been there been here one day <laughs> because I lived uh, a long time in Prague in Czech Republic which is like a nearby country but uh, anyways I'm an entrepreneur I have a marketing company and I'm involved in software development companies as well so uh, that's my background. Um, I'm my business background is mostly related to B two B sales, marketing, anything about this, anything related to IT, selling sort of complex IT projects. Um, and uh, in terms of my kind of upbringing, I, I was born Christian. Slovakia is a Christian country, at like seventy percent Catholic, oh, well, Christian, and maybe out of that, like eighty percent Catholic. So I was a Catholic, and then. At the age of 15, 16, I became an atheist. And then two year and a half ago, I think, I converted to Islam. So it's quite a long journey. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to wrap it up. Uh, but I'm oftentimes giving these, <clears throat> you know, telling these stories. Uh, but I'm more interested in, like, anything more practical I can bring to the table uh, that's more interesting for me. So, like, my story is quite boring. I was kind of, like, just uh, living this atheistic, nihilistic lifestyle. You know, like, like your typical, let's say, Western person, drinking, smoking, and doing anything like that, uh, living, uh, like uh, making money, then, and just trying to then self improve after some time. And uh, I was stuck in sort of depression, nihilism. I didn't see any meaning in life. Uh, it was really kind of dark. And uh, I just started researching more and kind of examining my belief system. So, I just thought like atheist is the best thing to do. Like that's normal to adopt uh, because all smart people are, are atheists, right? In like my mind. And uh, then I realized like, hold on, that's not necessarily true. Like uh, I started to questioning my beliefs 
And I realized like, oh, I actually don't know where morality comes from or I have no idea what is right or bad, you know? And that's kind of how I led myself to explore um, different things. And I started out, well, the, the most, the basic question, is there a God? So if I can at least get through that step, then I can build on top of it. And so once I, several months, I, I researched this and talked to many people. And then once I understood there could be just one creator, uh, which is all powerful or all knowing, you know, he doesn't begin or he ends, you know, all these attributes. I sort of looked at the religions and, uh, you know, I also consumed a lot of Islamic content. So it made sense that Islam uh, is like the most compatible with this idea of God. But uh, also I just, when I looked at the other religions, they didn't make sense to me. And so I just naturally started diving deeper into Islam and after some time I converted. So that's about it. I can go more in depth in each of these directions, but that's like a quick background. Okay. Jazakallah khair. So what was the first kind of, um, the first, kind of impulse or inkling that you had that pushed you towards Islam because I was um I don't want to go into too much of what I've read I mean sorry what I've watched because I was watching your interview with brother um, Ustad Daniel Hey Hadju um mm -hmm. earlier today I want to go into it with a bit more of like a blank slate but um I know that you before you were kind of anti-Islam somewhat um but even before that would you say what was your first kind of interaction with Islam and then what was your first positive interaction where um, you thought, you know what, I, I want to explore this? Yeah, well, I think people have to realize Islam is not what people look for. So Islam is the answer, but you don't start with Islam. You start with questioning some of the things in your life. So I've met, I've, I've touched Islam many in many parts of my life before. I've been to Turkey, for example. I've even met the president Erdogan, I don't know if I should say this, say this, but I actually met the guy like a few, like a 12 years ago. And I, I was in Turkey, I was in Ankara, I was in all these places, but I, I heard the Adan, it did nothing to me, really, like literally nothing. So I wasn't never kind of interested in religion. So it, it, it depends like where you are in life, what you want. Uh, so Islam is the answer, but you know, I can show you everything and you, you don't have to see it as truth. And for someone, it's like amazing. So uh, I've touched Islam all my life in some ways, but it never was something because like I interact with different ways of life all the time. Right. Like it's some some sometime like in the shop or something like uh, so uh, I think in terms of like when I started looking uh, for it deeper was like after uh, looking up these arguments for God's existence and everything like that. And diving deeper into Tawheed and the, the, the theology itself, uh, just the basics, like really like why are Muslims doing what they are doing? Why are they so like, um, let's say, uh, not strict, but why are they more strict than Christians, for example? Why do they believe what they believe? And I think it's strange because many people fear asking me, why do you believe Islam? Like my family members, nobody has asked me until now, uh, even today, like, why do you believe Islam? They just ask me, why don't you eat the meat? Uh, or I, I tell them, but I can't tell them because it comes back to Allah. So like I have to start with like this, this like answering the already kind of like secondary issue in Islam. Like it doesn't matter if I eat this meat or not. You, If you don't understand who is Allah, it doesn't make sense. So I have to ask, answer that question and we don't have time for this. So how do I do this? You know, it's always like a struggle. But I think it's just them. If they, I'm very open. You can ask me, why do you think is Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was the last messenger? You know, like you can ask me all these things, and I have pretty good answers. You know, I think so. So uh, I think that's the foundation of a Muslim belief. Not if I eat meat or pork, or if uh, you, you know, whatever else is like an issue in Islam. I think though, just if if you understand like the preservation of the Quran, the last Prophet, who is Allah Tawhid. You can build on that and you can destroy these foundations. So whatever else you bring in, I just view it as a secondary issue until you show me like where's the mistake in the crown or something else. I, uh, it doesn't phase me, you know, that much. So I think this, if you convert to Islam with that kind of strong foundation, it's going to be okay because I'm not converting because of my wife or something else. It's purely based off like 
reasons I've you know chosen and, and this strong foundation. So if you want to attack Islam, let's say, and um, kind of undermine my belief, you have to go really to the basics. You know, like it's not going to be enough to tell me like why the prophet had nine wives or something. Like those are stupid questions. You know, they're very easily to answer. But uh, so I think that's kind of bringing it back to the Quran and Sunnah, you know, and stuff. Yeah. Like that. Exactly. And I think that gives you a strong foundation. I know that's yeah. part of like the go rap da'wah mm -hmm. method as well, where obviously by and large most of the questions that we muslims will encounter um are going to be these kind of hot topic touch points either whatever's kind of go doing the rounds in the media like um halal slaughter and the um so-called uh, inhumane nature of that or um due to like the gynocentric uh, kind of society something to do with women's rights or something right they're kind of the ins that people have towards islam and then I can understand what you're saying because, and this happens with Muslims as well. Like, let's call it intra Muslim da'wah, right? It's like when you get relatively practicing Muslims versus non practicing Muslims or not as practicing. Unfortunately, there's like with the internet as well, information age, the gulf gets wider between those Muslims who know a little bit and those Muslims who kind of know nothing. And mm -hmm. the gulf gets wider because obviously people seek out the information that appeals to them. So the reason I'm saying that is because oftentimes, even with Muslims, I've had the uh, situations where like, say, there's a about the hadith about men not wearing silk or gold or something, mm -hmm. right? Or even why do men have the beard? Yeah. People try to um, find reasons that rationally kind of align with their thinking, right? Um, rather than going to the source. And obviously the scholars say that you can find those reasons, but it's not the core. It's not like the, the main reason is because this is the religion. This is what the Prophet wasallam said, or it's in the Quran or the tradition of the scholars. And that's why we believe it. As in, that's the element that people don't like. Even Muslims, yeah. because they've grown up, on, some of them have um, internalized this idea that um, there's a in islam we think right and we do you know like that al Quran, right like do they not ponder do they not reflect mm -hmm. but that's not for the minute things like oftentimes it does go back to this is the deen this is the ruling right so you have those discussions where i remember uh, why do men not wear silk and it's what it's like what you said when you try and do the answer of like that's not the question they think that you're avoiding the question or you're trying to be smart or you're just talking your way out of it when that's the actual answer because then they'll come up with reasons like oh it's feminine and then you like that might get you through your current phase in terms of like intellectually satisfying you but then you're uh, then you're essentially limiting it to a culture because what's seen as feminine now or what's seen as feminine a few hundred years ago might not be seen as feminine in another culture, right? So essentially you're mm -hmm. limiting the scope of the argument. But again, it's like, it's that constant, you have to wrestle with this because it's going to happen again and again. So anyway, went off on a little tangent there. Um, but that's what I mean. This is more like of a discussion. So I just wanted to bounce these ideas off you as well. No, um, no, I, I agree with that. Like, uh, I, I actually think it's like a trap because once you start answering something, then there's always another issue. There's always another thing. And it's never going to be enough. Like, you can go crazy like that. So it's not effective. It doesn't work. And it's just better to, uh, you know, uh, base, you know, just going back, yeah, with the GoRap method or something like that, which is quite tricky because it's like a complex thing you have to present, you know. So it's just, I don't know. I haven't found the best way to convey the message quickly or, like, effectively still. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just know, like, once you start answering these things, you're kind of falling into the trap uh, because you're answering. So this works in sales and business as well. Like, whoever's answering is, like, being sold to. And so that's, you know, you're kind of being sold that you have to justify your belief when the other person has a belief system as well. Maybe they don't realize it, but, you know, you, you should uh, kind of... Yeah, the submission part is difficult, right? Because you use your intellect and everything. But essentially, once you get to the point that Allah is not all knowing, you know, then anything that comes from the source is the truth. And obviously, you're a limited human being. So you can't possibly know everything. You will have a bias. Everyone does. So you just have to kind of align with 
what Allah and the, the Prophet says, you know, like it's pretty simple. And so, yeah, whenever I try to look at the rulings, I just try to go by the consensus or something like that. And I'm not, I'm not perfect. You know, I've been a Muslim only for a year and I'm almost like a few months, you know, so I'm still trying to get there. But anytime I'm kind of making a decision, it's not what I want. I'm trying to look at like, okay, what's probably, where's the, let's say, uh, where, where do the scholars agree or whatever is happening? And that's where I'm going with. Uh, so the beard, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I have like this, you know, some Asian people have it, but also like I, I don't have much beard on me, so <laughs> I, I would grow it. But there's there's certain things, you know, uh, yeah, I think people should, should realize like Islam is submission, uh, but you can use your reason and intellect to establish that Allah exists and all these things. Like, but once you get there, that's when it ends. Because you 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 want it's not about logic anymore, you know. The unseen is unseen for a reason. You know, it's not seen by the mm. logic or your intellect. It's beyond, you know. Mm. Yeah, Jazakallah khair. Um, it's funny you mentioned the beard. I think you shouldn't necessarily mention it because obviously Husnudan and um, we have a good opinion. But it reminded me of. Uh, <laughs> It reminded me of that time at university. There was this Malaysian brother, and we used to laugh about it because I don't know if you heard. You probably have Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, right? Yeah. <laughs> there's there's an old video of him where there's an old video of him where he's like uh, on stage answering questions from the audience, right? I don't know where he is. And uh, someone said in a question, and he's like reading off the piece of paper, and it says something about why you don't have a long beard, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it was just funny because his reaction, he, he was kind of upset by the question, obviously. But he was like, it doesn't grow. It, uh, it just reminded me of that. But anyway, um, yeah, so the next question was, I've noticed this somewhat um, in yourself, but also there's another Muslim recent revert. Um, I think you've had a podcast with him, although I wasn't, I didn't see it properly. Uh, he has, he's part of the Three Muslims podcast um uh, angle yeah yeah angle and he had a big kind of self-development youtube channel and i had actually seen some of his content before he came to islam um and i was just thinking this whole self-development path i think it does potentially open up people towards islam in in that it opens up people towards spirituality in general which is like a whole lot which can be a mess because most people will choose to go down the like you mentioned, the I'm spiritual, but I don't believe in God, kind of whatever gives them the most so-called freedom, right? Or they'll go into weird and wacky beliefs, whatever gives them a sense of purpose. But I think it does open people up because they're generally of people who have a growth mindset. They're more receptive to kind of learning new things and they're, they're more accepting of different ideas and viewpoints. Have you found well, you, that? You know what it is? It's mostly like... When you start self-improving you realize like oh there's a limit on my freedom for example i lost 25 kilograms right uh and th that that has to do with discipline of not eating and working out which is uncomfortable so i'm limiting my freedom i'm limiting the amount of food or whatever and i'm actually creating this this stress on me to work out why am i doing this well i have this long-term goal of doing this right and so once you start getting into this, this is just one example, but anything like that, what you realize like, oh, actually life is about like putting boundaries and limits on yourself. That's when the improvement happens in any area, business, physical, whatever. And so Angel did the same thing here. I think he realized like, oh, you, by putting restrictions on yourself, you're actually getting to the freedom part that people want because uh, you're no longer kind of like just... Uh, you know, let's say I want to eat this burger. I'm just going to eat it. Well, once you have this self-improvement mindset, you want to eat this burger, but you first have this filtering process. Well, it's going to make me fat. Okay, I have to do this. Then I have to work out or, you know, so there's different layers. And once you become a Muslim, there's another layer. What does Allah says about it? Like what's Islam, you know? So every decision you make goes through this process. If you don't have Allah and if you don't have this self-improvement, then you're just kind of doing whatever you want. Like you're just kind of like chaotic. You're being like completely indulged in the dunya, right? And that's not mm. healthy. Like you're being, uh, you don't even know you're, I lived that life. So I know it's a complete mess. Just like doing this, doing that, whatever you want. It's, it's, it's very tricky, you know? 
it's very self-destructive. So when you reach this point of self-destruction, whether physically or psychologically, you realize, oh, I have to improve, I have to lose weight, or I have to get better, I have to stop drinking alcohol, I have to stop, you know, uh, hanging out with the other uh, gender, whatever. And then you start doing this, and but you still reach the point of like, why am I doing it? You still haven't answered the basic question of your life, like, well, what is the meaning of this? Like, even if I self-improve forever, what's the purpose? You know, why am I getting fit? What am I doing here? Why am I making money? You know, making money just for making money, like what? <laughs> or making money to take care of my family, but why? You know, um, and so that's when you start getting into like, okay, how did I get here? What's my purpose? And how did the universe begin? And all that stuff. And those are the questions that then lead to more like from the self improvement mindset to more like, yeah, uh, not necessarily religion, but philosophy, religion, mysticism, whatever it is trying to answer some of the spiritual questions because you realize you don't just have the body, you have the spirit as well. And you have to somehow take care of it. But how? I don't know. So that's where you go kind of on a journey. And most people kind of take whatever, yoga, anything like that. But, uh, you know, I just wanted to know the truth. So I examined most of the systems out there. Yeah. Mm. And I think, obviously, another core question behind, like, this whole project is supposed to be about self-development and oftentimes I'll post like uh, Ustad Daniel Heihaju's videos or um, things like debunking some of the common criticisms of Islam or like some of the damaging mindsets that Muslims can adopt and the reason I do that even though it's not strictly like oh this isn't about how to lose weight or like improving your mindset to you know that kind of stuff mm -hmm. but it's more important because it's all about frame so like the way i can describe it is if you've got a muslim who's kind of a cultural muslim and they've not gone through that discovery process of um, learning the deen and like wrestling with themselves in terms of why they want to believe it um then ultimately their confidence is affected you know their everyday kind of level of confidence in terms of their identity so that's yeah. like for me that's like the core of self-development in terms of like if you've not even got like a confident frame where like you're going out in the world in a non-muslim country right think about it like you're learning the deen or um in terms of like you've gone into the deen like that and the same goes for a lot of these other uh, du'at um who like uh, invite people to islam and people often say like, oh, how come it's reverts that generally you're more on it and stuff like that. That's the reason, because they've gone through that learning process, which not a lot of born Muslims necessarily might not go through. Right. And the reason why it's important for self-development is because if you don't have that frame, it affects your overall level of confidence in who you are. So then everything else is built on like a faulty foundation. Um, so it's like you know how they talk about uh, you're in sales right so even in sales they talk about like how you have to have that frame you can't enter the other person's frame and then even um psychology and pick up and stuff like that um they talk about the same thing like you have to have a strong frame and maintain your frame in this situation and if you apply that to a muslim in everyday life it's like say if you're in the office environment someone asks about islam the one who doesn't have a strong frame there and they're like oh you know what and they just mutter under their breath like oh each to their own and they're kind of like looking to change the subject for me that person can't be like a proper okay that person can't be like a proud and practicing muslim because they they lose that frame obviously it's somewhat dependent on their personality intro extra or the rest of it but that underlying idea that i feel like you having gone through that journey you carry that with you wherever you go do you yeah, agree but you have you have to be yeah i agree with that like that's like the foundation like i think that's the most important thing in my life because i feel like very strongly about what i believe i don't think like i don't know what else what can shoot my belief at this point but i mean maybe something how to be loud uh, but uh, basically yeah but you have to be smart about it like realizing who you're talking to like if i'm around like all my family is not not Muslim. They don't have this framework. I can't go there and start, you know, telling them something from my perspective. Where where I'm, where I've gone, it's very deep. You know, they are just on the surface. Like I have to 
get to their level and just try to push them to where I am, you know, with smart DAWA. I have more time with them, years. You know, it's not like I have to do it now. It's more like, but living by example, you know. With the other people, it's more like being strong on, on what you believe, but also like realizing you are surrounded by fitna here. And like these people have, they don't have this idea that you have this compass, you know, like you have to kind of, uh, you have to adjust, you know, it's, it's tricky here. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I agree. Like you have to have a foundation. You can't compromise. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Like I was, uh, yesterday I had a wedding. Uh, there was, a, my cousin had a wedding and there was a vegan girlfriend of my cousin. Uh, and she was asking me about halal and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, halal, you know, it's all that. Uh, and she was like, vegans are, you know, because we don't eat animals because they suffer or something like that. Uh, but I think halal is better uh, than regular meat, let's say. Really? But still, it's a murder, you know, and stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> and I said, like, yeah, that's fine. I Like, I don't have a problem with murdering animals, by the way. <laughs> like, it just has to be done in the right order. So my problem is not... And by the way, your morality, where does it come from, this idea that animal is suffering? How, what, you're an atheist? She actually said she's an atheist. I didn't have time to go through exactly. a lengthy discussion, but it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, funny to, to discuss these things uh, with the different types of people who mm. believe different things. But uh, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, I was more speaking about, speaking about it from the perspective of like, just the deep level of confidence that it gives you. And then it gives you the ability to carry your faith with them. Um, I repeat. This yeah, often. I think I'm actually more more harder on like Muslims than on non-Muslims. Like when I see Muslims who are like uh, sliding away or who are trying to be nice or something uh, and, and compromise some of the things in Islam, especially, for example, we have this problem with Hadith rejectors or whatever. Like people just take some of the Sunnah and they just disregard it. Like, subhanAllah, what are you doing here? Like, I'm more strict on them because I know they have some level of knowledge already. They yeah. shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. But with the other guys, I'm not that strict, you know. Yeah. And um, it's just that I want to try and get people or Muslims to have that same feeling of, like, not necessarily that you know all the answers. Like you said, oh, yeah. even if you're uh, a Muslim for one and a half years, we're born Muslims. It's still, it, we're still on a path, right? Even if you've studied 10 years, it never ends, right? Not that you necessarily know all the answers, but that you have the confidence that the answers are there. And it's just a matter of going and finding them if you need to. And the way, because I've experienced it, I, I went to like a um, majority non-Muslim school when I was younger. And the first kind of um, sense of that that I got was in religious education classes and the level of confidence that I had just from basic Dr. Zakir Nike videos, because obviously mm -hmm. I was 14, 15, right? And I was always somewhat extroverted and whatnot. But in terms of when the teacher would ask a question, she'd say something about Islam and then be like, isn't that right, Adil? Or isn't that? And then I used to just go into like some speech like Dr. Zakir Nike from what I've seen. Nice. And the thing is, the whole everything was different in terms of most kids in that situation they're the only muslim okay if you want to get really like analytical people would say it's personality and stuff but like it's that frame that it gives you it's that level of confidence that it gives you and that you only get that through learning and finding right. out the answers and being able to communicate it in 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 a certain way and then um so it kind of shapes you then that gives you a sense of confidence in life in general and then you can build on to that whether it's health fitness making money finances getting married everything because you have like a strong core you have like a strong set of foundational beliefs you know like why people run to people like jordan peterson and stuff it's that kind of idea yeah i mean look this is like the most important thing because i mean subhanallah just yesterday we've got like a news somebody died in the family like in a car uh, in a motorbike accident you know like uh, guy who's like 30 years old he's not like a close family member but we we've met you know and uh, uh it was just like a shock you know we came home and just like okay this this person's dead you know in a in a motorbike crash and it's just like you know that's what it is like it can go quickly like you can die at any moment you have to get ready and like um 
always struggling with like looking at my whatever dunya possessions materials and then looking at like okay but my focus should be over here on the day of judgment really like that's my north star to to be really prepared because i can go anytime i i just drove like a thousand kilometers i could die any moment like um this is like the most to to be okay with dying is the most i think the biggest uh, kind of for non-muslims the biggest problem you know they are trying to ignore this part of life which is natural because most tribal people even non-muslims like thousands of years ago they knew like death is coming they were ready and they had different ways of going around it but modern people kind of like ignore that you know they try to uh, do anything to kind of distract themselves from the idea of like one day you won't exist in this dunya and that's kind of to come to terms with that like and to be okay with that not with the actual dying process because that's going to be difficult but to be okay with just kind of like moving on and not obsessing over going to space like elon musk or trying to stay here forever in some ai machine you know all these things are nonsense uh, yeah you know yeah so it's just kind of that brings peace to heart you know that idea which is, but also it's kind of you have this sense of like okay but i'm gonna be held accountable islam is not a free ticket like i'm gonna be held accountable and i have to be ready and you know look at the ambiya look at everyone everyone's scared of the day of judgment so why should i be okay you know it's not gonna be easy it's not gonna be nice and uh, i don't it doesn't matter what i think about it it mm. doesn't matter you know people have this idea like oh but it's not nice or this Christ. <laughs> I don't care what it is, you know, like this is the truth, like just get to it or don't accept it or whatever. But like, if I know this is the truth, then what am, what are you doing here? You can ignore yeah. it for what, 50 years maybe? Mm. You're still gonna die by the way, so yeah. you better get to it. There's that, there's that meme, isn't it? Like, thick doesn't, thick doesn't care about your feelings. Yeah. And um, the... Yeah, so you mentioned a couple of interesting points in there that I wanted to go back to. And one was where you mentioned the variation in the style of da'wah, which is very key um, because it's all contextual depending on who you're talking to, the length of the relationship, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and in everyday life, we have an appreciation for that. It's like, I think they say like, even in business like depending on the length of the perceived relationship is like the you can expect a certain response because if someone expects like short-term interaction from you and they're never going to do business with you again the likelihood that they might do something unethical or um, dishonest goes massively higher compared to if someone thinks you know what um, we're entering into like a 20-year potential partnership you know what i mean there's it's a different kind of so bringing that to the da'wah um i had a video ages ago like three years ago called um, da'wah 1.0 da 2.0 and the whole premise behind that is 1.0 is like speaker's corner it's like <clears throat> when you're standing on a street and you're doing physical da'wah and there's a place for that nothing wrong with that and there's a role for that in our society community right but essentially it's a whole different skill set and it's aimed towards i would say the lesser um, percentage of people who um, are into like the intellectual side of things and rationally um, justifying things and it's like short term you have to get their attention you know what the sales tactics of like oh I like your jacket that you're wearing can you come here for a chat you know and then go through the go wrap method that's one and then the second one is lifestyle da'wah like you said and from my experience I feel like lifestyle da'wah is a lot more um, powerful because lifestyle da'wah there's more riding on it and i think the reason why muslims run away from it and they think that da'wah is just for like a select few people that preach on the streets is because lifestyle da'wah you have to put your money where your mouth is so to speak as in you have to be living it for it to be effective right and the example i give is like in the office for example um unfortunately so I, I worked in an office where there were quite a few Muslims and that was by design. I wanted to work in an environment that was at least kind of welcoming of Muslims and stuff. But then unfortunately, you get to see this intra-Muslim kind of issues of like one guy dressing up as Santa Claus whilst he's Muslim. And then you're completely not taking part. And then the non-Muslims are like, oh, but why is such and such doing it? It kind of gives you even more of a predicament to deal with. Mm -hmm. But um, 
getting back to the point it's like unfortunately because the culture is the same same films same um food same topics of discussion same like oh let's not talk about religion because it's uncomfortable let's stay within the speech corridor they only see you as the same you're basically just a brown version of them right i'm speaking from like a, a pakistani mm-hmm. perspective you're a brown version of them and they're fine with it and then even if you have some particular quality that is because of your deep study of the sawuf right that you've managed to control your anger or something unfortunately because you've not made it visible and because you've not made islam as like the explanation for that people will just put it to your per- personality like oh he's a laid back kind of nice guy kind of thing instead of thinking how you know the heyday the people say of muslims that people used to go to muslims thinking he'll treat me right instead of thinking yeah this guy he'll be able to deal with it because he's a muslim right they just think or he's like uh, into stoicism or something you know what i mean like that's his philosophy and i feel like we as muslims we need to step up some of us like try and be that guy like with the right intention of like doing lifestyle that way because you um yeah i'll i'll pass it over to you to just share your thoughts on that and then i'll ask a specific question yeah i want an interesting idea that uh, i didn't think about before so like i look at it as like sales in business uh i'm talking about selling to other businesses so not to consumers but like between businesses anytime i was doing that i was trained many times uh, uh first like seven years ago eight years ago and it's always the same method it's similar to go rap but it's different so when you talk to a business person or a ceo or someone first you don't sell the product you have to kind of build out the challenge in them and then you kind of offer it a solution anyways there's a long step steps you do it kind of gets locked in your head and i use it to this day in any interaction that i have in business so what i learned in sales is that the one who speaks loses which means i win so this means like anytime i'm selling something i don't even talk about it i just anytime at the end they are ready to buy it and this is the, the highest level of sales you can get to where you don't even have to talk because the person who overly sells that's like a annoying car salesman that's like a typical meme but it's not real sales people real sales people who are making like millions of dollars they are very smart they they uncover your challenges you don't even know you have and they just kind of at the end give you this medicine but that's it and uh they let you speak and uh you know they they can work with you in wherever you are you know if you're aggressive they'll be like it's really really about psychology and this is what i learned like um anytime i'm selling even today um uh, i just kind of like start asking them like okay how how's how's business going right now how many i don't know new customers per month are you getting if if they are not answering i'm trying to give them some examples they hold on to something i try to go deeper and i just stayed with them in their pain for about half an hour just digging through it like just making them realize this is painful i'm not even mentioning what i'm doing you know just kind of drilling into them um and that's like takes years to develop but similar with dawa it's like you can't just say islam <laughs> like this is what islam says like no one cares it's a medicine but they don't even know they have a problem so you have to go back like all right how do i know that the, so you have different types of dawa as you said like you have intro muslim dawa let's say that's a different one that's more for like okay this is for scholars mostly like you need to like really go to the scholars because we're dealing with things which are fic or something like that it's not like an easy whatever a uh, dawa you know then you have this street dawa type of things but th- that's for people who are like people who watch those videos they are already watching them like for hours you know these people are crazy they are usually christians or some type of, and this is like 2% of overall population like who less than that intru- yeah like who's watching these type of videos i started watching them once i became really really interested in islam but in the beginning this was not on my list like i don't care who if uh, if uh, jesus is son of god or not son of god you know all these questions they are too deep for me in the beginning you know that's that's not what i'm looking for so i think that's that's necessary but that's already for people who are in that process researching it up um but you have this entire bucket of people who just kind of doing nothing and i think what i'm trying to do with we started a new organization here called tauhid and i'm not uh, there there's some some variations of this intra dawa because we don't have anything here kind of like books in our language or we did some videos how to make wudu how to pray because they didn't exist 
but uh, I'm uh, now we're focused on more like nihilism. So uh, more like just talking about regular life, uh, how it's just so you realize it's not okay to live like this, by the way, which you're living on the way you go to work, come back, give drink 10 beers, go out, with, hook up with someone, watch Netflix. That's not a good life. And you can feel it. And I, I can, I have my own experience, but I can objectively, objectively point to some data out there. I can use uh, any non-Muslim statistics to prove this. And I can just talk about this, like pointlessness of life like that, like meaningless. And people, the best thing is people feel it. Like people feel it. Like when I was back in my Jahiliya, anytime you, you know, when you drink alcohol, there comes a point where people open up. And they, uh, in the beginning, they talk about whatever, football or whatever. But once they are drunk, they start talking about their feelings and whatever. And that's when everyone kind of, and at least in my circle, started talking about, like, what's the point of life? What meaning? <laughs> it was just obvious, like, people are lost, like, really, really lost. Um, and, you know, it's it's just clear. It's in them. They don't show mm-hmm. it. But when they, there is there is this feeling, I don't know where it is, but or where it's, where it's coming from, but... I think it's because they are not in touch with their fitra, right? But that's what you kind of try to kind of uncloud. So I don't even think the Gorab method at all. I go way before that. I mm. think we need to just talk about the challenges of a modern person's life, how kind of depressing that is, kind of just living that. Because it's a night and day to what I used to live on back in my days. And now it's like, just from like purely like like how my state is as a human being, it's like way better. And but I don't go to concerts or I don't drink, I don't take weed, you know, but it's much better. My kind of like what a mental health, whatever this is. Hmm. So I think that's really, really key to talk about this. And then start, they start asking questions. We shouldn't start answering quickly. We should dig deeper again, like in sales and make them realize they ponder, they reflect, they come back to you. And then you don't even talk about Islam. You can just kind of talk about, anything else and then go to the go rap obviously maybe or some other method you yeah. have and then uh islam is like uh, yeah. yeah there are different people like we had a girl of a few weeks ago who emailed me like i want to become a muslim i was in morocco or something and i really i stayed with some family and i really loved the way they kind of the family interacted with each other and i was a catholic or whatever i believe in god already i do all these things I just need help to understand what happens in Jahannam. Like she just had a specific question. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. And you know, so I met match her up with another sister, mm. and uh, and we answer her question or something. But uh, that's a person who's already like at the end of the journey. So like I think about it as a marketing funnel. You have you have all these leads coming in. Yeah, you have to I kind just of prioritize them. You know, that's the word I wrote on there whilst you're talking funnel. I was gonna use the same example. It's like the people that yeah. watch these videos they're already in the funnel in terms of like they know the basics and they're just but they are not not converting well they are like the ones who are most stubborn because they have some foundation different like they are either christian or buddhist or whatever yeah so they don't want to move they have some uh, other agenda you know yeah and that and there the utility in those debates is that you're not necessarily trying to get them it's the people that watch it's like the more neutral people um, that that sometimes get swayed by it but I was like thinking that the lifestyle dawa approach is like you've got time say if you're in the workplace right and you're working with the same people for five years right Mm -hmm. sooner or later they're gonna see you go through different emotional transitions that are um that come in day-to-day working life right you might be stressed you might have a tight deadline um you might have a client that's shouting at you on the phone all these are you're not doing it because you're showing that you're Muslim. This should be natural to you. That's what that's what I'm trying to say. But what I'm saying is that over time, people should be able to spot. And then the ones whose fitra calls them, um, because you're not just going around randomly, like uh, thinking like randomly telling people a hadith and like just before there's even any kind of inkling from them. Um, but it's more so, I was listening to that Blogging Theology podcast recently with Sheikh Shadi. And he was talking about it as well, this same concept about appealing to people's emotional kind of um, void or like the soul, you know, like the when people are on their search to kind of fill that void in their soul, right? And that's what kind of opens up more um, 
opportunities for that way in terms of lifestyle that way because then they're already looking and they'll pick up certain things like everybody else so when they get an annoying client they start effing and jeffing on the phone and you can tell that they're flustered and like they have a tight deadline or their job might be in danger or whatever they react this way this person he's got a different disposition or she's got a different disposition why is that kind of thing and then say like when they talk to you over time you'll be able to say certain things because it's natural to you like they're your own mental tattoos like oh did you know we've got this hadith or basically we have this belief that we have that um everything for muslims good and it's like um if something harmful like in the in like the real world sense something that's apparently harmful happens to you you get rewarded for being patient and if something that's overtly good in the real world happens to you alhamdulillah is good and you also get rewarded for being patient in that situation little things like that that would kind of sow the seed and it shows that your belief system is not because you've been studying marcus aurelius it's because you have this foundational belief system of islam so that's where like the lifestyle that were is most in my experience that's what i've found um because that kind of has more of an appeal to people's soul and it's like a emotional transference so like people pick up on like the overall vibe i don't want to get too airy fairy <laughs> i don't want to get too into that zone of like vibes and stuff but essentially it is because your mindset is like a core belief that you've um, accepted in your mind that kind of translates into your day-to-day -day, um conduct essentially because if your mindset is things like based on that hadith about things being good and having patience and being rewarded that translates into real world action and that's an attractive kind of countercultural quality to have in this day and age so that's what i was referring to when i say stuff like uh, the lifestyle that way element um in terms of yeah. peaking people's interests no I, i agree i agree it's just i think with family it's slightly even different because like uh yesterday i was doing wudu <laughs> during the wedding as a mm. random guy and my grandfather was standing behind me he didn't get it like what's you doing uh, and i'm just like i'm gonna pray you know i need to pray five times a day he's like you're still doing that <laughs> like yeah and uh you know he's just seeing like this guy is really like on it still like even in the middle of the wedding like i just get up and go he's like what why and my mom was like very sad like why are you doing this i'm like mom i i told you you already know about islam she knows everything but she just does it didn't click for her like no i'm this is really what i'm doing like i'm not doing five times a day when i want to do it or whatever you know like i'm just doing it and this is the bare minimum like <laughs> maybe they are looking at it like this guy is really extreme but in a muslim world this is a bare minimum praying five times a day <laughs> i'm not even doing anything crazy on top of it you know like mm. this is nothing this yeah. is basically your foundation you know but it's just funny and this takes years like uh, you know to to tell them like i i bought a property in my country like a land and i said like yeah like what about mortgage or something i said like no mortgage it's riba riba free which uh, did you know like as a muslim i can't get any loans or anything like riba related so i can't have like uh usury or whatever so i just made a lot of money and bought a land you know and uh, it's like you know they it's like interesting you know some things in islam are really interesting because they answer like all the problems in society like we have a lot of people in debt here a lot of, a lot of people own money to stupid loan providers or something so that's like you know there's a lot of solutions in islam we're not presenting but uh, yeah. you know i i'm just still on the in the beginning and we'll see where it takes yeah. this yeah that's a good example of what i was talking about definitely because essentially you're embodying a solution for a problem that people have and people just pick up on it slowly over but time, even muslims know? are okay with it but like i know many muslims who say we live in a non-muslim land so it's okay to do like this and that i'm yeah. like well what's the scholarly consensus on that i know there's one fatwa or something but that's not for you that's yeah. for the refugees so well, yeah. i know like how muslims think uh, when they want to go around the, the dean yeah uh, but uh and there are many excuses and i'm not saying like oh you are the worst person or whatever you know but like yeah. you know i know i know some this is the correct thing and whatever you want to do do it i'm not gonna tell you you're but yeah. i'm just gonna tell you this is the correct thing and you know whatever you do with that information it's on you it's on yeah you. 
because people start going into the minorities as in but i'm not gonna be like like you have to do this you know I'm, i understand you have maybe difficult situation you have maybe some like i don't know where your life you know like you're in different place like i'm very lucky i have different life than diff other people you know so i know if you have like three kids you have like husband who left you or something like people have difficult lives you know so yeah yeah exactly you know and that's not what we're saying when we talk about the general rules i know in the uk um i was quite surprised to learn but i learned recently that quite a predominant opinion of the scholars um actually i, I don't know whether i should go into that because obviously then there's like is that you can get a mortgage for the house that you live in but other than that well the can't... uk is completely different than what we have here so anything that yeah. happens in the uk uh, should be directed to uk muslims and yeah exactly uh, yeah and the other thing was that what you said about exception is that when you mentioned the general rule, the general rule is the general rule. It's like the obligation of Hajj, right? It's the yeah. general obligation. But in terms of there's um, there's a criteria in terms of if you got mm -hmm. if you don't fill that, you don't have to do Hajj, right? And that's that's the specific circumstance. But in terms of Hajj, no one has an issue with it. But when you start talking about other things like um, let's say uh, women going into the workforce right instead of focusing on the family everyone starts having this kind of allergic reaction what about the um, female gynecologist what about um, the female dentist or doctors or whatever and you like what about the single mother with three kids and you like that's the general rule as in you don't need to go to the exceptions with everyone it's like inherent in what you're saying but i feel like we have a different reaction because think about it, it's the same concept with something like Hajj or with something like even Zakat, you have to have a minimum amount before you pay it. But when you say the obligation of Zakat or Hajj, no one says, what about the single mother that only has this much money? You're saying they have to. No, it's just a general reminder that's in Adin. You know what I mean? There's that element into it as well. Yeah, okay. like you can even eat pork if you want. If you're dying, exactly. that's a condition. <laughs> yeah. So you can, in Islam, everything is contextual, I realize. Like everything is contextual. So, well, depending yeah. on your context, that's when that's how Islam fits. But you, you go know? if you're in a desert and you only see pig and you're about to die, you probably <laughs> should eat it, right? <laughs> Which is not going to happen in pig in the desert. But most ninety nine percent of ninety percent of the world should not eat it. But anyway, so like everything has its own rulings. You know? Yeah, but it doesn't take away from what you in terms of when you're speaking about the general rulings that apply to everyone. Yeah. You don't have to keep mentioning like the oh let's not even talk about that because there's exceptional cases no there are exceptions for a reason you know what i mean so anyway um so wow it's been like 50 over 50 minutes so alhamdulillah that was a quite a deep kind of discussion i think on we touched on a lot of topics in terms of that one um i wanted to kind of change topics somewhat um i had a list of things that i wanted to speak about and obviously we've just only just finished the dawah subject um just in terms of your life in general say after you became muslim how would you say that affected um your journey on self-development and also your journey in business because as excuse me as far as i understand it you've been in business for a few years or four or five years and you became muslim one and a half years ago so how would you say has that affected your business practices in any way in terms of like the ethics and stuff like that? Yeah, in terms of affecting my business, uh, tremendously, tremendously. Basically, like I can tell you maybe just two years, two and a half years ago, I was completely broke, even though I was like owning my company, like I was not making any money. I was like broke and just like last week i bought like a, a huge land which i don't i'm not going to mention anything but like i'm in a completely different world now and it's all from one dua one dua i made and it's crazy i went to istanbul you know i, I converted i went to istanbul and i just uh, it's actually my youtube this dua thing uh, where mm. you know just from one dua one simple thing i got like 12 clients or something and just start pouring in and i decided like okay I was just gonna let uh, Allah guide me, like whatever in business, because, uh, and you know, I had this intention of like owning a home or something without riba, because I I thought like I'm gonna be a Muslim. It's very difficult here. Like, how am I gonna do it? You know, uh, 
but it's just our views. Like if you are, if you want, like whatever is possible, you just have to kind of ask for it. And um, so it had a, a, like a, it changed my life completely. Like I, it's essentially, yeah, I was a businessman. I actually am not, I'm not doing anything else. I'm still doing the same business. <laughs> so like my, any, nothing changed in my life. Uh, in my sort of strategic thinking or anything like that on my company services it's all the same it's just this it's, now i'm a muslim and uh there's a different i don't know what happened but yeah so it, it changed a lot uh and my thinking uh yeah so that's i think the biggest impact i had Alhamdulillah. Yeah. that's definitely something i don't think it would happen like without me becoming a muslim because even the idea, I had like a creative idea, which wasn't from my head. It like was completely random. And I know it's random doesn't exist in Islam, but like I know it didn't come from me, this idea. And I I just know how to execute things. So I'm a very good kind of a startup guy where I have like an idea. I launched multiple projects very quickly to just quickly get the market feedback. I don't like to wait for things to work out or like pray that maybe after two years of developing something it might work no like let's just launch something very small quickly get feedback let's see if it works and then if it does then let's improve iterate and create a better version that's how like business works because once if you spend too much money on developing something people don't want then you're kind of broke you wasted a lot of time so so yeah i just uh, i have this i think that's my biggest skill set but um so but the idea wasn't mine it just came to me from the above so i just executed the idea so i don't actually think i did anything special it's just the same thing i'm doing all the time what a blessing because alhamdulillah that definitely solidifies it strengthens your iman and faith and it's like unexplainable when you have these occurrences that you know are only through a dua or like only through praying or only through allah and it's a feeling that you try to, it's hard to kind of get across to other people because it's literally yeah. quite life changing. And what I would say is, like, Alhamdulillah, like you're saying, maintain that level of gratitude because it's easy to start. Um, you get uh, shaitan. You can start stuff, right? thinking like I did that. You know, like it's exactly. All me. Yeah. And it's not. Even... Yeah. Especially in this, it's the danger that I've spoken about before in terms of like being on the self development kind of hype. It, because you're kind of um, analyzing the different skills that you're acquiring and stuff like that it's very easy to think like oh yeah but i read this book and then i did this but you you did that all through the guidance and kind of the will of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah, like you have to just understand your risk was already determined for you it's mm. not you're doing it it's just you're going in some direction yes you have some free will but the path was already predetermined yeah. You're just kind of walking through it. So uh, that's how I see it. Before I was like, yeah, I'm like, like I was like watching these videos, like as an Muslim, like, yeah, I'm going to be a millionaire, right? You know, like these yeah. ideas, like millionaire before 30, like what, how does that help you? In Even if you achieve that goal, you're empty then. Like you go, and what next? Two, two million dollars or what? what yeah. Like three? And that, that's my life. Like, like uh, just so, such a shallow goal to yeah. have these, this mindset and just like I don't know I used to be that guy who was like hyped up by all mm. these kind of things and I just look at it now whenever I watch a video like from some guru or something it's just laughable to me right now it's really laughable like oh I used to believe this or I used to like think he's like even though they may be successful like in some area whatever but like where what are they calling towards you know they're giving you some underlying messages with the message they're selling you there's some underlying philosophies they're also pushing on you which you're taking on if you're consuming materialism the main one yeah yeah, yeah. that anything you can uh, that that you can be happy with uh with let's say when you improve your life once you improve it you will be yeah. you know happier or you can uh you know yeah i mean when they define the happiness like yeah, I'll buy a new car, so I'll be happy. Yes, I'll be happier for a few minutes or maybe two days, but then it starts being annoying because I have to park the car. I had this experience. I bought the car. I had to park it. I then have to pay for the parking ticket, like for, and then I have to look for a place to, I don't know. So it's just, it, it stops being happy, you know, very quickly. Anything yeah. in the dunya starts going very quickly down the hill. 
even if you buy a new apartment, anything like it starts kind of to annoy you after a few days. Yeah. And it's yeah. not nice anymore. And people are like, exactly. oh, what a, what a nice thing. Like, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't see it like that. Like, it's crazy. Like, I, I remember how I used to think like, like 10 years ago or like 12 years ago, I used to work in a factory, like in a like factory for a minimum wage. And I would just dream about my life in college or something. And just like, I'm going to have this thing and that. And now if I have something like that, I, I don't even realize like, oh, back then I would be amazed at my life right now. <laughs> but it's just like, I'm still the same guy. And it's not amazing. It's I don't think it's ever going to be amazing. If I, Even if I have $100 million or I don't know, helicopter, nothing, yeah. nothing. I would much better be in some Medina just, uh, just worshiping Allah. Like that's my... If Allah gives me old age, like that's subhanAllah, that's what I want to do. Like just, just, just spend some time, just, just isolated, you know, just, just, uh, in, in some mosque or something. Um, mm. I don't know, but, uh, I just, the reality of this world is, it's like this, you know, so I just feel that people are missing out on such a big thing in their life without Islam. It's just really sad to see this, you know, people lost in confusion drinking doing this going just like mm. and it's not like you can just tell them like look it's 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 hard to tell them like okay there's the day of judgment <laughs> you know uh there's gonna be this there's this it's very difficult to to to, to tell this to someone yeah. you know because it's a lot to handle it's like mm. oh. so yeah. i don't know is that hedonic adaptation isn't it where like you get used to it and i, I feel like this is potentially like quite a deep point but it's like the way to balance it is by having a starting a family and realigning your motivations as to why you want these things because look um i realized very early on this whole realization of like how money or material things aren't going to make you happy right and so then it can affect your motivation because sometimes and i feel some muslims are in this as well where it's like what's the point like let's just do our basic ibadah and whatnot but you have to realign your intention as to why you're doing certain things like even with going to the gym stuff like that realign your intention so that you're also getting reward for it don't otherwise you're just wasting your time in terms of you might be getting the outward health benefits but why not capitalize on the opportunity of getting good deeds for that by setting your intention that you're doing it to like um, for your spouse or like to be a better father have more strength mm -hmm. live into old age you're uh, effectively multiplying the good deeds that you're getting by doing something like that and i feel like ultimately everything's about neurochemicals when it comes down to like happiness and serotonin dopamine right once you understand that and you understand that you know there's that guy he has the saying that if a cup of coffee is not going to make you happy nothing's going to make you happy that doesn't mean that if you hate coffee but the yeah. point is like if something simple can't make you happy because essentially if you break it down on a neurochemical level it's the same thing it's just a burst of dopamine and whether it's like a private jet or a cup of coffee after like a fast or after waking up in the morning on a on a level it's the same thing inside so once you understand that on a deep level you realize that it's futile chasing these things yeah, and that's what that's what Ramadan does, like fasting, you know, just kind of detaching yourself from all these things. You realize like, oh, I find real, like, that's really good. Like the happiness yeah. I feel once I do iftar or yeah. once I pray tarawih or whatever, like that's more meaningful to me than whatever happened in my business. Like, I don't really care about that. Like, because it's like, and this is what the big realization is like by by actually removing yourself because people try to externalize take money take product services whatever like this is where the happiness is it's actually by removing your yourself from this uh dunya and not by saying like in a buddhist sense where you have to meditate forever and whatever do something like that but just kind of like it's healthy to stop stressing over your job you know like whatever you can get fired tomorrow so what just go do, do something else like anything can happen like really like just stop stressing about these uh, these yeah. things you know yeah. there are more uh, more important things in life and you know this is what ramadan is really perfect for fasting. yeah yeah and there's actually a hadith um about that as well that the believer has happiness when he opens his fast 
Um, and there's another, obviously not quoting directly, but there's another instance mentioned in the same hadith. But essentially, that's that system, isn't it? That um, you don't have to figure it out on like, a, oh, that's dopamine being released and stuff, right? <laughs> essentially, this is like timeless wisdom. And um, yeah, so... Yeah, like the best feeling recently I've got is like when I go pray Fajr in the mosque on Friday, and mm. then I walk out and it's like before the sunrise, like maybe yeah. like a few minutes still. Yeah. And I can just see like it's there's like a hill and I can just see the curvature of the earth slightly. Mm. Like it's just like no one anywhere. It's like I'm alone, you know, like mm. 4 a.m., whatever, 3 a.m. And I just I usually have a walk around the park, mm. uh, sometimes with a friend or sometimes alone. Mm. And it's just perfect because the, the way you can reflect after Fajr uh when this this is happening when there's yeah. no one here and you can see the earth yeah. it's completely different because then i let's say i go to sleep then i wake up i'm, I'm going to work I'm, I'm stressing people everywhere going tram all, all this nonsense you know it's not possible to just kind of stop and look at it but after that it's like perfect and the, these uh, this is not like you don't have to do this this is not far or whatever but it's like i just think like um we should move beyond this halal haram stuff and just get a better understanding of like the more you come closer to deen to allah it's better for you it's better it's mm. gonna be better it's all these uh, additional acts of worship they really changed me the dhikr and all these things you know it's it's quite important i think uh after some time you know after you know how to pray after you you've been in like the basics okay you need to step up again it's not time to chill you know you again go to the next level and yeah then, I don't know, like, I'm yeah, still definitely. new, but uh, you can't just relax, you know. Yeah. I think because that's when you stagnate and you kind of just like, I don't know, don't improve. And I think you should yeah. improve in Islam and also in your, let's say, dunya, whatever. Things. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to start bringing it to a close because uh, I need to pray okay. Maghrib in a bit. But a um, couple more questions, if that's all right. You can make more brief. If you've got time. Sure. Um, so one was like an observation that I made um, potentially because I could talk about these ideas for ages um, especially with someone like yourself um, because you share that similar kind of way of thinking but um, one is that I feel like it was quite refreshing I saw your video um, made a few months back about saving money right how to use your business to make save money essentially um generate money essentially and then stack it and the reason why that was refreshing is because you've reverted to islam relatively recently 1.5 years um but you've not done what is sometimes tempting to a lot of reverts which is like you know what i'm about to go and live in a cave now um on the hill and like give up the dunya and stuff again not saying anything necessarily inherently wrong with that but I feel like there's a tendency, not just for reverts, but people who rediscover Islam, let's say, in university or something, they go all in. Sometimes that even goes towards like the extreme sides, right? I feel like, speak on how you were able to retain that, as in like a Muslim, but you're using that to kind of optimize your life in general. And it's not like, oh, I'm Muslim now and it's time to like spend five years just um, in solitude yeah. kind of thing. You know what I mean? It depends how you look at it, you know. Maybe my idea is that uh, the better I can improve whatever my life, the, the more people I can help or the more resources I can uh, have for the ummah or anything like that. So it's like in a plane, you know, when you have the mask oxygen, you have to put it on yourself first and then on the others. And I'm not saying like I'm going to, you know, I don't know where the end is or whether I have a limit or what the amount of revenue I want to achieve or whatever it is like that. But I just have a really, I have like one of my best friends is Algerian in uh, Prague. Uh, we used to hang out every day and he's also like uh, kind of at the same level of uh, entrepreneurship with me. And he's also, he has multiple properties and he's also kind of in a similar mindset as me. And there's a couple of other brothers who are a lot of Muslim friends of mine are entrepreneurs. So I had this kind of like surrounding. I had a good like umma around me in my local city where I converted. So it was it was good for me to, to get their perspective as well. Um, 
and yeah. they explaining as well like this is not for the dunya we're not doing it because of this i'm sending money to my family in algeria i'm building a school i'm doing this and i can do so many things you can do your dawa in slow whatever you know i need money for this and I'm printing Qurans, something like that you know so like um so i think that's one one way to look at it but i get the other perspective as well there are people like it's very depends on who you are or what Allah gave you as like a skill set. Like my, one of my good friends, he's a historian. He just loves studying Arabic, uh, like a convert, and he he writes long articles about complex issues which I don't even understand. And it's like that's his thing. Like he can mm. be in solitude. He's not interested in making money or doing anything in business. He's like fine with some job or and that's it. You know and he has a wife and whatever like that's his life mm, and indeed. there's nothing wrong with that like everyone mm. has a whatever role i'm not better he's not better it's all the same thing we just have different things i'm not a guy who studies well like i can't i i can't study of course i did study but i'm just more practical in this kind of like economy guy i don't know how to say it. um i i just like to be more creative and stuff but some people are not like that everyone has a different inclination mm. and i respect all of this and we need people who know good arabic we need people who can translate the hadiths we need everyone has a role and i haven't mind but whatever uh, so i think there's nothing wrong with going either way whatever you feel like doing or whatever is the talent you have yeah um, go with that you know i don't Indeed. think we can just say like do this as we did or do this as as they do Mm. you know if you want to move to saudi arabia and grow a beard and live in mm. uh, medina that's do that you know like do whatever you you need to do to to be the best muslim you can so and whatever doors are open for you as well yeah exactly. whatever doors are exactly. open for you and like there's the story of a famous uh, scholar um i'm forgetting the name but it's one of the major scholars where um there was like an ascetic person that said to him like um you wear these nice clothes and you go out and you sit in public and you give these dars and stuff right do you not think it would be better if you gave all that up and just studied and like the scholar was like allah's opened doors for different people and inshallah we're both we're both on the right as in you just worshiping that's good but me giving dars and all the rest of it that's also good right and um, it's like a similar point and yeah jazakallah khair is a, that was a, a nice yeah i think but i think that's a good point like a lot of people are like uh, saying like oh you now need to study for 10 years and things like that and i do i try to improve i try to try to learn arabic like i try to go through this stuff it's slow it's it's not i'm not very talented about it and i try to get to some level and Alhamdulillah, maybe spend some months in the Muslim country, you know, just get into that uh, mindset uh, because it's much better over there. But uh, I know, I know already what I'm good at. I'm not mm. a young, I'm, I'm 30 years old. I've tried mm. many things in my life. I'm not like mm. trying to find myself, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a scholar. I'm not, I'm not a scholar. I'm mm. not, uh, you know, I, I know where, where I kind of fit, but I do try to improve with mm. my knowledge as well but i think that there's different there's people who have much better talents like they can memorize books they can like see all these things they they are linguistically much better um so they can take the knowledge and you know and 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 you know um there's the other people then who can communicate better and maybe talk about that knowledge in a more simpler way and do the dawa you know and mm. so that's a different skill set then mm. um, so it's all like that uh, I don't think everyone, every Muslim now has to become like a scholar. That's unrealistic, you know. Yeah. Because, like people but we should have, always... have to go to work, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Stuff. Yeah. And you realize um, this has been like a ever, this has always been a problem for people on the Dean. And um, I say problem, I mean like it's been something to think about because it's even the story of um, um, Abu Hanifa who... Um, it was someone he was working in the market and um because he was involved in kind of trading and stuff um trading the old-fashioned way before someone thinks it was like stocks yeah. <laughs> stock broker but um and then there was a someone who commented on him saying that i think you've got a good mind and you should 
study more, right? And it was that encouragement that made him pursue studying and become who he was. And um, also another example is um, Ibn Josie, who who has some books that you might be interested in because it's a, a rare insight you get into him because they're like um, diary entries. So, you know, it's a very different insight you get into the mind of a scholar um, from however many years ago it was. And um, I've got a video on it, but it's like personal reminders and it puts everything in context. And he's got one particular passage, if you're interested, I can send it to you afterwards, where he's basically like going through the plus and minuses in his head. And it's like, look, um, I want to get married and I want to have children, but that takes a lot of money. And to get money, I need to spend a lot of time working. That takes away from my time studying. I want to get the best in the world, but I also want to study and give dars and do. And it's like a refreshing kind of insight that you get into the inner workings of a scholar's mind, especially from hundreds of years ago. And you realize that the problems aren't that different to a, a modern day kind of um, student or someone looking to get into the dean more seriously and it's a human problem so then the kind of lesson that you get from that is like focus on the intention as long as you're getting rewarded for your effort ultimately we're concerned with the reward um, that we get for the intention and struggle not necessarily the results and that's like another refreshing kind of mindset that you have um, and um, yeah and likewise in business you can potentially uh, supercharge your Arabic journey by being in a position where you can dedicate more time to it rather than doing it 30 minutes a day. Um, I'm also on that journey, so potentially uh, you've probably got better people than me to ask, but I can potentially point you towards certain resources and stuff in terms of Arabic mm -hmm. as well. Um, so yeah, last question, Jazakallah Khair, um, is just to give us a sample of whatever you're comfortable with in terms of like your daily routine, or like let's say, yeah, your daily routine. Uh, you don't have to mention any of like the Islamic stuff necessarily because I know people you don't necessarily want to like publicize all the stuff that you do for the Dean, but just in general, like um, from a self development perspective, it's like a common question people ask, like Tim Ferriss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it varies because um, I'm not like some uh, some like I'm traveling sometimes or I'm doing different things, but I say when I'm like and I just moved to another country, so. Uh, but when I'm like settled and I have like a routine, let's say in the city, so I don't know, I wake up. <laughs> uh, so obviously you do Fajr, sorry, I forgot yeah. about that. So besides the, the Islamic stuff, uh, uh, I have a coffee in the morning <laughs> and then uh, I usually, uh, you know, work from home up until like lunch. So I check on my emails. Um, I have some meetings virtually. Mm. And I do some some of that stuff, like the kind of harder meetings in the morning. Mm. Um, and then when the lunch comes, I usually uh, I go to the city. Uh, so I pack uh, I, uh, and I pack my gym clothes or whatever I need, so I don't have to come back. And uh, I go to eat some halal to some halal restaurant. Um, then once I eat, I go to the office. Uh, in the office. I work, so I work for a few hours, meetings, uh, whatever, um, podcasting, anything that happens. Um, and then around like four or five, like I, I'm pretty flexible, like because like my one of my companies is fully remote digital and I don't spend too much time on it because I set it up. So it's just my lifestyle business. I'm not really trying to grow it. The other one is more like a growth one. So that I'm trying to spend, I'm, I'm, and I have another thing. So I'm like split all over the place. I don't have like a eight hour schedule. Like I even consider doing this interview as like a work because it's like, you know, I, I have like a YouTube I need to do. I have this, I have multiple channels. It's like whatever, I have different schedules, but I just do it in the office. And at the end I go to the gym. So I either box or I go jogging or something like this. Every day I do one physical activity. Uh, if I'm not like traveling, like in a plane or something, like I have like a day off. Uh, mm. And then I, I at the end of the day, I go and with my wife, she, we eat dinner. So we go to uh, either a halal restaurant or we uh, eat something. She cooks pizza or whatever. We eat something at home. We watch uh, like a, uh, like a, some TV series or something. Like we spend like 50 minutes on something. 
we mm. talk about our day, uh, whatever happened. Yeah. Because she works in my company, so it's much easier. Mm. Uh, and uh, and then we go to sleep, and um, <laughs> and then I edit some and no, I edit some videos usually, like like or I uh, okay, I play like one video game, play FIFA, you know the the. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the football game i play like yeah. one game a, a day usually mm. it takes like 10 minutes but i like that it's you know fully halal <laughs> but i'm just kind of like uh, <laughs> uh i try to kind of like uh, i have only one game on my computer for like eight years it's always fifa uh, mm. i don't do anything else because i know I'm, i get too addicted to any games yeah so i don't recommend any games uh but fifa is just kind of like i don't know i just play a game and i go to sleep you know that's mm. it that's what typical day Okay, Jazakallah Khairan. Um, so I'll be sharing this, Jazakallah Khairan, for your time. And um, sure. I'll also be making these small reels out of this, which I, I kind of um, get a lot of um, shareability on Instagram because Instagram's pushing out reels. So I'll invite you as a collaborator on some of them, and then it's up to you if you want to accept it. Um, aside mm -hmm. from that, I was going to say, good. yeah, Jazakallah Khair for your time. I would talk to you more, but I've got to go. And um, we'll see. Uh, keep in touch, and we might have a second podcast interview in the future, inshallah. Inshallah. All right. Jazakallah khair, and uh, yeah, hope it was useful for someone. Yeah, Jazakallah khair, and I pray um, Allah gives you more blessings and everything goes well for you, inshallah, in your new country. And yeah, Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Thank you. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم